All right, we're going to get started as uh, I value everyone's time. And uh, again, I want to thank everyone for attending. Uh, my name is Anton Loof, and I'm with a company called Ponton Industries. Uh, we are a uh, manufacturer's representative agency of a number of different companies. Uh, for those of you who just uh, logged into the webinar here, um, the basics are if you have any questions, there's a Q&A button on the left. Feel free to press that button and ask any questions that you might have. Um, I will pause throughout the um, webinar to answer any questions, to look at the, that list, and also we'll have time at the end to answer any detailed questions if you have any. Um, and then we're gonna record this and send it out uh, out there. I see a number of people on the list uh, who are attending that I'm familiar with and that I know, so welcome. Um, I see some from Hawaii actually, so, uh, that's an early good morning uh, and mahalo for uh, for attending. So, uh, all right. So, who is uh, who is Ponton Industries? Uh, we are a uh, company who's been around for about fifty years. We celebrate our fiftieth anniversary this year. We were going to have a big bash, but like everything else, that got canceled. So, um, so we just in spirit, we'll uh, be thankful that uh, the company has been around for fifty years. So, and we're doing well. Um, we are uh, manufacturer's representatives uh, for what are called primary measurements. Uh, everything from level, flow, pressure, uh, control systems for motors, VFDs, wastewater, uh, drinking water, and industrial applications. So if it's being measured, we typically have something that can make that measurement. Uh, analytical uh, instruments as well. Uh, so, all right, let's get started. So open channel flow. Um, if you're interested in open channel flow, it's because uh, it's typically a, a challenging measurement to make. And it, open channel flow is designed uh, or defined, I should say, um, as when you can actually see the liquid itself. If you're looking at a refinery, you really don't see gasoline and oil flowing around in different places. Those are in pipes and they're in conduits, if you will, and they're under pressure. Uh, open channel flow is not under pressure. Uh, you, it's open to the atmosphere. And um, it typically flows in a channel or a pipe, uh, but has a headspace or air above it, which is set to atmosphere. So people want to make this measurement for a number of different reasons. Uh, and then we have some examples in the photos here. Um, a, a creek on the left could be for environmental reasons, uh, for fish, for fish hatcheries, or for um, you know for other environmental reasons. The the middle image is an irrigation canal. Uh, so various irrigation districts charge um, for their water usage and, you know, by the type of crop that they have. So it's important to know how much water a particular uh, district is pushing out to uh, various agricultural re regions. The photo on the left is a weir in a wastewater treatment plant, actually. And uh, we're going to be talking about weirs as well. So there's a lot of challenges surrounding uh, the measurement of open channel flow. Um, there could be solids in the liquid, which makes it very difficult um, to measure with some instruments. Um, you might not be able to get to it because it's perhaps underground uh, in a manhole. It could be 50 feet in a manhole. Uh, they could be remote locations where you can normally not access it on a regular basis. You can't drive to it. Uh, you could have standing water, a pool of water um, I like to say uh, sometimes during some presentations, you know, how much how much flow is there in a bucket of water with eight inches of water? And, um, you know, the answer is zero. It's just sitting there. There's no flow. Uh, so standing water is a challenge. Um, measuring how much flow is coming off of a steep hill uh, or a steep channel. That's very difficult to measure uh, because of the speed. And then in many industrial applications, it could be highly corrosive. So any instruments or devices you have out there may not last very long. So we'll break out open channel flow measurement into two different uh, methodologies. Using primary devices, uh, and we're going to talk about that, and using what are called area velocity flow meters. And we'll be discussing that as well. So a primary device is essentially a geometric shape that takes the water, and channels it through a known dimension 
and creates what's called a head versus flow relationship or a depth of the water to how much water is going through relationship. So what you see here in the image on the lower right is a what's called a flume and it's forcing a restriction in the flow which is backing up the water. Uh, and it's backing up the water in a known repeatable manner. And there have been many studies and models that have taken particular dimensions and categorized or characterized, I should say, the amount of level in relationship to the amount of flow. Uh, so it's a, only a level measurement is required when you are trying to convert level to a flow rate. So these dimensions uh, are known and you can just look them up um, in engineering handbooks for a given type of primary device. And there are numerous kinds of primary devices and they all have pros and cons and flow ranges. So there's a lot of things you need to know before sizing and selecting a type of primary device. So these are some examples. Uh, the photo on the lower left is uh, a photo I took in the Central Valley of California. Uh, this is a cast in place concrete uh, primary device. Um, and this particular irrigation district uh, modeled it um, and created a table. And uh, you can see that cylindrical thing is, I'm not sure if my, uh, my arrow is working, here it is. Um, and the, the meter is actually sitting in here and there's a piece of conduit uh, where it is measuring level. So again, with primary devices, all you're doing is measuring level and converting it to a flow read reading. On the right is an example of a primary device. And this particular one is called a partial flume. And it's being measured by an ultrasonic sensor above it, the blue one. And then it just also happens to have a built-in ruler uh, because again, level measurement is gonna give you a flow reading. Uh, some flume examples here. Um, on the lower left is what we call an H flume. And this particular flume is designed to not flow straight through, but to pour over like a pitcher. And this flume actually happens to be in San Francisco. Um, and it's uh, measuring a creek that is no longer a creek. They uh, long ago turned a creek into an underground uh, aquifer and, and you know, flowing, flowing into this basin here ends up going into a water plant that's in the Presidio. Uh, and on the right is a flume used for industrial waste. Um, and you see the gentleman here um, calibrating not only the flow, but in this particular case, it has um, a pH sensor and a uh, conductivity sensor. So they were uh, their permit required them to measure both pH and conductivity in addition to flow. Um, a common application for open channel flow is within the influent or effluent of uh, wastewater treatment plants. Uh, water plants can have raw water coming into the plant, but more often than not, they're being pumped out um, using different technology than open channel flow. So in these particular examples, again, we have an ultrasonic sensor here, and we are measuring the level over a flume as well. So this is a graphical image of a, of a primary device. Uh, in this particular case, it's a uh, partial flume. Um, this top image is the top view showing the flow going from left to right. Um, the arrow, the black arrow on the left, the converging section shows the water converging, getting squeezed down and backing up. So that's why you see on the lower image, the water is deeper there and it, it should be flowing in the light blue uh, condition. Uh, there are cases where if you have the water backed up downstream, it will start building up the darker blue section and, that, and that's something that you don't want. And we're gonna get into that uh, in a few slides here. Uh, so there's the converging section on the left and the diverging section on the right. And what we are trying to avoid with a flume is the backing up of the water within that flume. Uh, it will give you false readings. I'll see if there's any questions here. No, nothing right now. 
All right, so some of the advantages of flumes uh, and limitations. Um, uh, a flume, uh, depending on the dimensions, uh, can be actually a low cost solution to creating a flow meter. Um, flumes can handle sol. I say some can handle solids because if the flume gets too small, it will only pass what the dimension of the flume is. So if it's a two inch throat width, it will only pass objects as large as two inches. Anything larger, it will block. Um, the examples of the photos that I've shown, such as a irrigation channel, well, they're 15, 20 feet wide, so they, they can pass quite large objects. And also flumes going into a treatment plant are often large, you know, three or four feet wide, so they can also pass large objects. But in certain industrial waste situations where you might have a, um, a four inch pipe and you have to constrict that down to a two inch size flume, if you had anything larger than two inches, it would definitely block it and cause problems with the measurement. So it's all about thinking about your application, uh, what, what you could foresee in the future flowing, um, what your expected flow rates are, if you have any solids, a lot of considerations when making the decision to go with a flume. Um, so, but you can have some good readings if installed properly. Uh, and the beauty of the flume also is you can verify the accuracy of your measurement with a ruler. You just go in there and see what the ruler says. If it says you have 10 inches of water and your meter, your electronic meter says you have 9.98 inches of water, then you're probably calibrated and good. So it's easy to verify uh, your flow measurement. The negatives about a flume. Well, uh, uh, potentially inexpensive, it could be potentially very expensive. So if you were to look at putting a flume in downstream of an industrial site, you might need to install an entirely new manhole, as an example. Or if you're doing a stream, you, you may or may not be able to even install a flow meter. There might be limitations as to what's legally allowed in a, uh, a natural environment. Um, and then if you are allowed to, it, it could turn into a large construction project. So oftentimes the construction costs are more than the device itself. Um, the most important one is the second bullet point is that the it requires correct approach conditions to be accurate. Uh, so if you're not familiar with engineering a site for use with a flume, you could run into some real trouble. And later on, there's going to be finger pointing with regards to accuracy uh, because one of the considerations may not have been taken, such as say downstream conditions, you know, water backing up into the flume is going to give you false high readings. And then your, uh, if it's a billing site used for revenue, uh, then there's going to be some discussion about, you know, how accurate is it at the higher flow rates? Uh, what happens if it backs up downstream? Uh, so you need to be really aware of conditions now and conditions in the future, what could happen when it rains? Uh, so those, those are things to think about. Um, it requires your velocity to be controlled um, we like to say that the velocity entering a flume should be smooth and tranquil. Uh, we don't want a fire hydrant getting blown through a primary device. We want it to just roll into the flume slowly and then pour out and get rid of it. Uh, and then the last bullet point is it's not accurate during surcharge conditions. So <clears throat> if you were to back up or you have too much flow for a given size, it will give you false high readings. So you don't want to do that. Um, I've had one case only where it actually did quite the opposite. It gave a false low reading um, because the slope coming into the flume was so steep that the water literally was cleaned out of the flume and was negative reading. So it was below the zero point when there was flow. And that's an application I realized that you can have false low readings, even though you have flow. So I do see a question here. Um, is there dampening or averaging on the analog output on a Hydro Ranger? Um, that's a detailed question here. So there is definitely dampening, uh, and you're being specific on the analog output. Um, I want to see if I can have Daniel um, do a quick research and give me an answer on that one. Um, I want to say yes. Uh, it makes sense that there should be dampening on the analog output, but I'll, I'll get an answer for you uh, before this thing is over. 
Um, Oh, did I go too far? Okay, a weir. A weir is a little bit different. Um, I like to think of a weir as a, uh, a, a dam or a similar object built across a water channel. Uh, it's generally used to control the depth of the water behind it. So if you're controlling the depth of a reservoir, you could have a adjustable weir that goes up and down. Um, but there are weirs used as flow devices or primary devices. And these are essentially openings where the water flows over a rectangular opening or a triangular or a what's called a v-notch opening and then there are different dimensions or types of those weirs and and all of those sizes have been modeled so that there's a relationship between the level of the water behind the weir and also the amount of flow going over the weir and so there's a number of different kinds of weirs that have like everything else pros and cons to their design uh, so it's important to know what the particular design requirements are to determine which weir is suitable for your application. Weir, weirs uh, uh, fall in, I'll say, into a couple different uh, definitions. We have on the top right a uh, V-notch weir. This is a 90-degree V-notch. So you can see that this angle here is 90 degrees. And you can do a quick Google search for 90-degree V-notch weir table. And it's going to give you a Excel spreadsheet of how deep is this water relative to this tip, this point here, and how much flow is going over it. And in this particular case, you can see this red arrow is pointing to an ultrasonic sensor. So this ultrasonic sensor is above the water, measuring and calculating the depth of this water to give you a flow rate. On the bottom is a rectangular weir. Uh, so it's rectangular in shape, and the water just flows right over it and you same measurement is made just like on the top uh, so the top v-notch weir has better resolution at the low end um, the bottom rectangular weir in this particular case has better uh, upper range flow capability so it can handle more flows typically so there's a little animation here this is a gif i'm not sure how well this looks on a presentation looks good on my screen but it may not translate well on a webinar uh, it's essentially showing you for about eight seconds flow going over that into a basin below that. All right, we have a question here. Uh, do, do solids build up on the bottom of the partial flume containment affect flow measurement? Well, um, on the upstream side, you're rarely going to see uh, solids build up uh, because the partial flume will actually speed up the flow enough to clear that out. Um, but solids building up on the bottom of partial flume uh, can affect the flow measurement, um, especially as it starts, you know, building up to where it becomes a major percentage of the dimensions of the flume. Um, if it's sized properly, you shouldn't see those um, those solids building up on the bottom of the flume, um, it, it, in the flume itself, uh, because the speed is going to be fast enough to scrub that out. But in answer to your question, if you have solids building up on the bottom of it, yes, it will affect the flow measurement. All right, so weirs. Uh, weirs have advantages. Um, they're cheap, potentially. Um, I've seen a number of uh, municipal agencies and industrial agencies make their own. They get a sheet of aluminum. It could be four feet wide. They, uh, they cut out the notch. They level it out. They uh, put it in place in a channel and they start measuring flow. Um, it's also easy to check with a ruler to see if your flow uh, meter itself is reading level properly. Um, so people can make weir boxes, um, and it's not too expensive to buy a piece of uh, sheet steel, sheet aluminum, or even plastic. Uh, there are some basic rules of thumb on the design or the lip of the weir itself, um, but people can make their own. Uh, it could be expensive, uh, especially if you're doing construction in a larger installation. Um, it cannot handle solids uh, because solids will back up behind a weir. So if you have a lot of grit or debris, um, or if it's sanitary sewage, you would not use a weir um, unless you planned on periodically doing maintenance. Uh, I'm not a big fan of maintenance, so I don't recommend weirs in applications where there are high solids and as long as people know that, they do have to clean that out. Uh, 
The other thing like flumes is to have proper hydraulics upstream and weir should be pouring out. They should not be flowing through a weir. They should be just pouring out over a weir. So there's some hydraulics that have to be uh, considered uh, when choosing this. So those are primary devices that we've discussed, uh, flumes, weirs. Um, there are various methods to measure level since flumes and weirs only need a level measurement to calculate flow. We're going to go through some of these uh, methods to measure level and their pros and cons as well. So hydrostatic pressure sensor um, is a diaphragm under the water, like your eardrum, and uh, it measures the water pressure uh, over or surrounding the uh, diaphragm, and it outputs a signal proportional to the depth of water. Um, and it is linear, so that's, uh, that's nice. So you could drop a sensor that you see similar to the one in the image into um, a tank or a creek or a lift station or, or any liquid, if you will, uh, in, in this case, mostly water, um, and it will give you an output relative to the depth of the water. So it's just like your ear. Uh, so if you go to the bottom of the pool um, and you can feel the pressure on your ear, it's exactly how this works, is the greater the pressure underwater, it's pushing on a diaphragm, just like your eardrum, and it's measuring that difference electronically and sending out its signal. Uh, they're very simple. Advantages, actually, are, I didn't put that in here, but the cost. These sensors are quite inexpensive. Um, and they can measure small level changes, so you have good accuracy. It's probably better than the accuracy of the flume or weir itself. Um, you can use it in dirty liquids, such as wastewater. Um, and it has good long-term performance. I know a number of municipal agencies who have used these for years. And as long as they get cleaned and maintained, uh, they last for a long time. Um, some of the limitations or disadvantages is they can foul and clog. Uh, and this really follows under the heading of lack of maintenance. If you're not maintaining your equipment uh, or familiar with what, how, and when they need to be maintained, um, they will then uh, start to fail. Uh, they can drift over time if not maintained properly. Um, sometimes on the bottom of some tanks or wet wells, they can get banged around and, and hit the pump. Um, they can get damaged physically. Uh, so it does require periodic cleaning. Um, and they can get physically damaged just by banging them around. So ultrasonic is another method. Uh, ultrasonic is just uh, like some animals out in the world use uh, to determine distance and range. And in some cases, they calculate speed. Uh, so we have an image of a bat on the, on the lower left. Uh, looking at a mosquito or some sort of bug and then the dolphin doing the same thing uh, underwater. So in air or in water, you can echolocate or determine distance using sound and the speed of sound. So the dolphin is aware of what the speed of sound is underwater at a given temperature and the bat is doing the same thing. It, it's familiar with what the speed of sound is at a given temperature uh, in air. Uh, Here's an example of a Siemens uh, branded ultrasonic uh, transmitter. Um, this is some of the current models uh, that are out there. Um, and these devices, for example, will take the level. Uh, it can take the level using either ultrasonic or submerged pressure and calculate the flow. So the formulas or the modeled numbers in the tables are built into these devices. Uh, there's a number of different manufacturers who make these. Uh, this is just an example, um, and a lot of the newer models have some interesting features that make it a lot easier, built-in data logging, some have built-in telemetry, uh, so they're easier th to use than ever before, uh, and it, it beats making a hand level measurement if you can have a trend. Uh, I'd much rather have a history of what's happening than just a snapshot of what's happening. It's kind of like at home. I... Uh, I logged on to my water district's uh, website, and you can now, for free, take a look at what your water trends are. So it's an interesting uh, interesting thing now that my uh, water meter has telemetry, and I can log into it and get a history of uh, who's been using water and when, <laughs> when's been using water, or if you have a water leak. So uh, 
There's no reason these days not to get a water meter for measuring flow uh, if that flow measurement is important to you. So ultrasonic uh, is uh, has to be one of the most popular uh, automated methods for use with flumes. Um, a staff gauge is probably the most common one throughout the world, which is just a ruler sitting in uh, sitting in a flow measurement uh, flume or weir. Uh, but to automate it, um, ultrasonic because of its uh, uh, ease of use and maintenance free nature. Um, um, it's probably the most popular method that I've seen out there. Um, many of the meters out there include uh, all the formulas uh, uh, for primary devices, for the common ones. If there's custom devices, uh, most of the instruments out there these days give you the ability to add custom, um, custom uh, formulas. Uh, a lot of them are a lot easier to use nowadays uh, because of the... Uh, uh, implementation of the software and uh, and CPUs and computers in these devices. So let me stop here. Look at some questions. Um, so, what is the best type of level measurement device, uh, ultrasonic or other, for flumes? Um, so let's let's finish this topic um, on different level measurement techniques. Um, so I'm gonna the next screen is probably gonna get tell you what the pros and cons are uh of ultrasonic and then we'll get into some other measurement so uh, there really is no answer what is the best um it depends on what you have and uh next question for the submerged sensor previously does it require a stilling well um it does not uh, uh weir especially it's pretty quiet it's already still behind it uh so you don't need that in a flume um it may there are some flume manufacturers who have uh, stilling wells, um, and others will have a cavity on the bottom of the flume itself to keep it from being an obstruction. Um, in dirty applications, I'm not a fan of stilling wells, a stilling, especially if it's sewage. Um, a stilling well could get septic and the holes will get clogged. Um, and uh, that's, that's not my preference. Again, I, I prefer low maintenance and a stilling well can be high maintenance if the water is dirty. Uh, what's the narrowest beam angle that Siemens touts with their ultrasonics? I'll have to look that up. I didn't memorize that one. Um, I wanted to say 5%, but don't hold me to that. And is there a maintenance required for ultrasonics to clean the sensor? Um, and that's from application to application. It could get dirty. And um, if it's a dusty environment uh, or a foggy, misty, dusty environment, it could be very often. Um, if it's an environment that's... Uh, Clean and dry, never. Uh, actually, it's quite uh, it's quite capable of working with a dirty face as well. So uh, the face of the sensor is vibrating, so it will actually keep and slough off uh, a lot of dirt and moisture. All right. Uh, so here's uh, ultrasonic level uh, examples for Siemens in particular. Um, there's a number of manufacturers and it's, it's pretty simple how it works. Uh, just like that bat, it sends out an echo and then, uh, is quiet and is listening for the echo to come back. So it hits the surface of the water and bounces back to the ultrasonic and it knows what its temperature is. It knows what the speed of sound is at 20 degrees centigrade. And it then says, well, it took this long. So I know my distance is X. Uh, and then it says, you've told me that the bottom of the tank or flume is X plus two. I know it's two inches. So that's how it's working actually to calculate level. And then the instrument itself will take that level and convert it to flow readings. So uh, ultrasonic level. Uh, so sound is transmitted to the surface of the water to calculate distance and then, I'm sorry, to determine distance, calculate depth. It's non-contact, that's the number one advantage is it's not touching the liquid um, and not interfering with the flow of the liquid or the liquid interfering with the operation of the sensor. Uh, it can be low cost. So there are some low cost versions out there and there are some not so low cost versions out there. It's definitely low maintenance because it's out of the water and it's very accurate. Ultrasonics can be to a millimeter um, and it's extra reliable because again, it's not in the liquid itself.
the limitations for an ultrasonic, and this is not an ultrasonic in the photo, um, but the purpose of the photo is um, foam. Ultrasonic does not work when there's a thick head of foam on your flow. So if you have a flume or a weir uh, with a lot of foam in this application, um, I would not use ultrasonic technology. So it doesn't work, it doesn't cut through that foam. Um, you could have outdoor applications where it's extremely windy. Ultrasonic is essentially sending sound waves to the surface of the water. Uh, and just like you or I, if you're um, shouting in the wind um, and the wind is in your face, somebody even uh, 20 feet away is not going to hear you very well uh, if it's a windy application. So it'll blow the sound away to the side and you will not have a, uh, a good reading. Um, obstructions are also a problem. So you might not be able to see from the top the surface of the water. You could have uh, conduit, you could have wires, you could have sticks or branches. Uh, so in a natural environment, if something changes where there's a plant suddenly growing in front of the uh, ultrasonic, you'll you'll lose your reading. All right, so uh, question. Are all the sensors discussed today can be used for open channel flow measurement? Absolutely. Absolutely. So it, all of these can be used in open channel flow measurement. Uh, the ones we've discussed so far require some sort of weir or primary device, such as a flume or a, um, yeah, such as a flume. So uh, this method for measuring level is uh, what's called a bubbler level. Um, it is generated, uh, this measurement is made by air supply, pushing a constant rate of bubbles through tubing. Um, and the deeper the water, the harder it is to keep pushing those bubbles through the tubing. So the amount of pressure goes up, up, up. No pressure, no level. Higher pressure, higher level. Um, so it's again, it's it's similar to the submerged pressure sensor, but it's different in that it's uh, it's requiring an air compressor um, and it's pushing a known constant rate of bubbles out. Uh, and that effort to push those bubbles out is proportional to the depth of the water itself. Um, some advantages, it works in turbulence, works with foam. Uh, so you can have all kinds of things going on on top. Um, it's still going to work on bottom. Uh, it's low maintenance, um, except for applications where you have a lot of solids or sticky glues or some other chemicals in the water that can cause it to build up. Um, I'm familiar with an industrial site. Um, that has what appears to be calcification in the water. And every six months or so, they have to chip away at the flu or at the weir and at the bubble tube to get this built up debris off of it, which will clog the tubing. So you got to keep that tubing that you see here on the bottom uh, clear and, and free of blockage. So um, if the water doesn't uh, have buildup like that, it's low maintenance. Uh, it's accurate and it's extremely reliable because it doesn't care about any uh, chemical condition, chemical conditions. So corrosion is not a problem and foam is not a problem. Um, it typically does have higher energy requirements. So in portable battery powered applications, uh, it does have limitations and it can get clogged. So uh, that's a possibility too. And so you do have to keep an eye on that part of it. Um, Manning equation. Um, I kind of threw this one in here um, uh, in this uh, presentation because of the fact that you don't need a primary device uh, for a Manning equation. All you need is a, a round pipe and it has to just flow uh, out and over the edge of a cliff, if you will. So there's a lot of here for this to be even close to working. Um, the formula here is shown on the slide. Um, and there's a number of things that have to be measured. So A is actually what you measure with a level only meter, and the rest of it is either known or calculated. And um, so you could see a graphical image of what these particular parameters are and, uh, uh, and what you need to know. So the cross-sectional area is calculated by the the level measurement. So again, all those previous level technologies that we mentioned, bubbler, ultrasonic, um, those are uh, 
uh, methods to calculate the A. The rest of it, such as slope, you have to you have to come up with that number. Roughness coefficient has to be the hardest one to come up with because it's how much uh, restriction is there in that 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 pipe is causing on the water itself. So it could be slowing it down if it's a rough aggregate. Um, you're just a shot in the dark as to what your roughness coefficient is going to be. The accuracy, assuming you've actually figured out some of these uh, numbers, such as roughness coefficient and slope, you're probably lucky to get into the 10 to 20% accuracy range, which for some applications could be sufficient. Uh, for anything having to do with money, probably not. Um, and if you have anything less than ideal, you're probably looking at a 25 to 30% error and you could even have a greater error um, if you really have a rough earthen channel uh, you're going to have some uh, or rough earthen or corrugated pipe that can cause some real problems too and then if conditions change um, all bets are off all bets are off so manning is a quick shoot from the hip type of measurement uh, a lot of people don't use it uh, in real time continuously measuring and using manning um, they it's just a quick uh, shot uh now that said uh i'll say that some people will actually use one of the next technologies we're going to show you to characterize a pipe first and then back into manning using that those measurements so you can kind of get these numbers from doing a different flow measurement and then use an instrument which is level only to get you these numbers And how are we doing on time? We're doing good. Um, area velocity flow meters. So this is what I'm getting at. If you can use an area velocity flow meter uh, to first measure your pipe, you may be able to use Manning uh, because the area velocity flow meter will tell you if it's sufficient for using a Manning equation. And so this is a graphic uh, showing you an area velocity sensor. So what is the area velocity measurement? So we're measuring two things now. Uh, we're measuring the area, or A, and we're measuring the velocity as well, or the speed of it going by. Um, I wish I had a graphic image showing a, a square pipe uh, because it's easier to use in terminology of uh, area. So if you had a square pipe um, and it's one square foot and it's moving at three feet per second, uh, you just multiply the two because the flow or Q is equal to the area. We'll say one square foot times three feet per second is going to be cubic feet per second. And then all instruments have some sort of method to change from CFS to units that might be uh, better for your application, whether it's MGD, gallons per minute, liters per minute, you know, whatever. So the measurement now requires two measurements, level to calculate A, and speed of the water to calculate V or to measure V to then come up with a flow reading. So that's what an area of velocity flow meter measurement is. So what are the advantages of the area of velocity uh, flow meter over a primary device or a flume or a weir? Uh, well, you can have speed. So in, if you recall in the weirs and flumes, we don't want speed. Uh, so 20 feet per second is moving. Uh, so if you look at your office or your house right now and you look at 20 feet and you say, imagine water going by that distance in one second, that's very fast water. Well, an area of velocity meter can measure that. A weir or a flume definitely could not. Um, many area velocity meters also work in surcharge conditions. So even though the pipe uh, is full completely, it still is able to measure how much flow is going through that pipe. Uh, some instruments can measure reverse flows. So if you have something with tidal conditions um, and you want to measure the reverse flows or in different directions, irrigation channels, um, you should look at those meters that can measure reverse as well. Um, and oftentimes use of an area velocity meter may not require any construction or changes to the stream or channel or pipe. Uh, it just works uh, with the existing situation. Uh, some of the limitations or disadvantages, uh, depending on the technology, it may require more maintenance. Um, generally speaking, underwater sensors uh, can get fouled 
And depending on how bad it is in that application, it could get fouled quickly. So if you have a lot of dirt or debris or, or solids or chemicals or you know grease, it, it could be a problem. So there are some uh, things that can be done about that. Check any questions. Oh, I guess it scrolls. Uh, da, 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 da. Stilling well. How about right, radar? Uh, great question. Radar, absolutely. Um, I only had so many slides and time in my presentation, but radar can absolutely be used to measure level. It's a level measurement tool. Um, most radar meters don't have the formulas for the primary devices built in, um, but there are instruments. We have some instruments that will take the signal from a radar and run it through the formula as well to give you a, a flow reading for various primary devices. So if um, if your applications uh, maybe with foam and you want to do something non-contact, um, radar may work in your application. So that's definitely uh, something that could be used. Um, what about problems with ultrasonic sensors inside large circular pipes? Can the signal bounce off the circular surface on the invert, causing accuracy issues in low flow conditions? Um, I haven't seen that. Most application, most instruments these days have settings that limit your range. So if it's looking at uh, the bottom and bouncing off and looking at the top, that's beyond the zero distance, and it should throw that out. Um, so there should be some um, data correction uh, in most meters these days that allow you to block out any reflections off the bottom uh, that might be looking at the top. Um, so that's the answer is yes, you can have reflections, but there should be uh, softwares or parameters to prevent that. Uh, in oil and grease, ooh, um, I'm not sure of the question. Yeah, I'm not sure of the question. Um, if you have grease, oy, if you could rephrase that question, that'd be great. Um, how long does it take to calibrate the bubbler? Um, it shouldn't take long at all. Um, it depends on how you have to adjust it and which bubbler you have. Um, but calibrating any of these level measurements is a matter of just taking a level measurement with a ruler um, and making sure that your instrument is reading properly. Um, some bubblers uh, require a, um, a zero and a span. So you could take disconnect the tubing and make sure it reads zero um, or drain, drain the channel and make sure it reads zero and then uh, put it in a known depth and make sure it reads that depth. Uh, and then it's, it depends on the bubbler that you have, how long it takes to calibrate. Can a single existing bubbler system be temporarily extended to measure sewage level in new multiple manholes? Um, gee, if you had a manifold, um, that would be a calibration nightmare, I think, because um, each, each manhole would have a different set of effort required, uh, even at empty, to push a bubble through. Uh, so I think that would be a challenge. There would have to be multiple um, uh, calibrations. Can a single existing bubbler system be temporarily, temporarily extended to measure sewage level? Well, the same question. Um, should we use the downstream or upstream slope in the Manning's equation? Well, that's a great question. Uh, you should use the upstream slope because downstream, there should not be much of a slope at all. It should be very steep. Um, if not going over the edge of a cliff. Uh, so you should have um, um, a known upstream slope and uh, just make sure that your downstream is steeper than your upstream. Are polymer bolus flumes common in wastewater conveyance? Uh, also, what is the best technique to verify flow with a polymer bolus when the zero point is not at the bottom? Uh, that's a great question. Um, I had some applications where it was miscalibrated because of that. So, but the first question is, are they common in wastewater? Um, for the larger sizes, yes, because there's enough water to move debris along. Um, when you get into four inch flumes or even six inch polymer bolus flumes, you can have debris settle out on the inlet side and that's not a good thing, um, especially in wastewater. You're, you're going to have a little bit of everything in wastewater, grit, dirt, you know, feces, whatever um 
And so Palmer Bolus is probably not my choice unless it gets into the bigger sizes um, because Palmer Bolus is easier to install and is wider and allows bigger solids to go through. The best technique to verify flow is to stop the flow. Absolutely. Uh, if you could stop the flow and make it read zero, then that uh, standing water that you're going to see on the bottom of a Palmer Bolus flume is going to be stable and be your definite zero. If you cannot stop the flow, then you just put a ruler into the very bottom and you subtract that standing water that you're going to see in the flume. So uh, standing water is equal to one sixth of the size of the flume. So a 12 inch Palmer Bolus flume, for example, is going to have two inches of standing water at zero flow. So you just have to subtract that two inches. Uh, and you don't take the measurement at the hump. You do it right below the ultrasonic head. And thank you. Yes, I was in the bubbler. So bubbler with grease and oil. Um, is that the question? Uh, yeah, I guess uh, in oil and greasy applications, you can use a bubbler. Um, not sure what that question uh, question was. Can area velocity meter and ultrasonic work in a combined open channel flow measurement set to overcome false readings when reversing flow applications? Um, so yes, the question is, um, can you use an area velocity meter um, in a combined open channel flow measurement set up to overcome false readings when reversing flow approaches uh, the zero flow rate. Um, so area velocity, we're gonna get into this here. So area velocity um, oops, has a wide range. The problem with area velocity, uh, one of them is, um, is its ability to measure speeds near zero. So typically, you, uh, depending on the technology, you can only measure speeds as slow as 0.2 or 0.3 feet per second. So as it approaches zero, it will have trouble recognizing that. So when there's a window when it reverses direction or it gets down to zero where it's not gonna have an ability to measure. So if you have applications um, where your flow is just a trickle, and it's moving slowly, that's a very difficult application. Uh, and so you might have to look at using a weir uh, or a flume for that. Um, so yes, ultrasonic also can measure down to zero um, and not necessarily require a probe on the bottom, which, which can't necessarily measure down to zero, sometimes down to a quarter inch or a half inch. Uh, so you can use ultrasonic to start getting into the lower lower level ranges. Hopefully that answers your question. Um, all right, let's move on. We're almost done here. Um, oops, we'll skip something. Um, advantages. Nope, got that. So um, measure speed of the particulates and depth of the water. Um, this is a... Um, example of a sensor that's under the water and it's measuring the solids as they go by. These are relatively inexpensive. Uh, they can measure slow velocities, but typically down to about 0 0.2, 0 0.25 feet per second at the slowest. Uh, they can also measure reverse flow. So in irrigation or situations where it gets down to negative numbers, you can use this technology. Uh, but be aware that the disadvantages are they can get covered with dirt or debris they will stop measuring velocity when they get covered up. They'll still measure level, but no longer velocity. Um, and it requires solids in the water. Uh, although um, in cases that I've seen of snow runoff, you can have some problems because snow runoff is so clean. Um, there might be other technologies that you should use. Um, and so higher maintenance because it is under sewage or underwater. Uh, so I like to tell people if I was underwater all the time, and especially sewage, I would require a lot more maintenance too. Uh, there are non-contact methods also. So there's a, a few manufacturers out there who measure AV or area velocity flow meters that are above the pipe. Um, and in this particular case, this uses a radar gun for measuring the speed of the water going by and ultrasonic measuring the depth of the water going by. So uh, it does the math for flow, the same, Q equals AV equation, it just is not underwater. 
uh, this particular device is manufactured by a company called Hawk, H-A-C-H, and it sits above water, as you can see here. It has a depth sensor for measuring the depth of the water and a radar sensor for measuring the speed of the water. And with those two parameters, it will calculate flow. Uh, if for some reason it goes underwater, it, uh, it will use a third sensor called a, uh, a surcharge depth sensor. So it uses another technology, what we talked about, which was the hydrostatic pressure measurement. And uh, when it's under surcharge conditions, it will measure the speed of the water using a mag meter that's built into it. So this particular unit has actually four sensors in it uh, to calculate flow depending on the condition. Uh, the advantages of a non-contact area velocity flow measurement is it's non-contact. It's uh, low maintenance. It won't foul because uh, it's out of the water. Um, reduced maintenance costs um, to actually no maintenance costs. So it depends on the installation. Um, it does cost more, definitely. And um, this particular one is not bi-directional. So in most cases, people don't have water going in two directions. Um, also, it requires a little bit higher minimum velocity. So you're looking at a, a half a foot per second speed minimum. Uh, uh, with the LUT, okay. Will the LUT400 LUT series transmitters now available? How relevant are hydro rangers and multi rangers in the current time? Um, Hydro rangers and multi rangers are absolutely relevant because they include more relays. So you're going to find them more in lift station control and pump control applications. Um, so they can they can do more with more relays. Um, so LUT is series a better choice for water and wastewater? Not necessarily. It's a nice choice for flow. It's um, uh, but it can't do a, a triplex pump control station if that's what you're trying to do. So uh, there are different instruments for different applications uh, primarily. Are there laser measurement products? Absolutely. Um, there's manufacturers who will use uh, laser to measure the speed of the water going by. Um, and as I mentioned throughout this presentation, there's pros and cons to all the measurements. Uh, laser is an uh, optical measurement, so it requires the optics to be clean. So if you have an application where it's not foggy or high humidity, uh, then absolutely that is an option for you. Um, so that's a competitive product to what we carry. And I'll, I'll be more than happy to talk about that. Um, but yeah, it, it can be used uh, for measuring velocity. Um, overall, the rest of the instrument is using the same technology to measure level and, and submerge pressure itself. So there's no difference there. Uh, what kind of accuracy do you see with the FLODAR? Um, that, like all the other measurements, is a function of how good is that flow site. Uh, so as I like to say, better sites produce better results. Um, if you put a FLODAR in a straight run application, it's going to give you better accuracy than if it's around an elbow or a turn or, or has high turbulence. Um, so the best accuracy that I've probably seen is in the two to 3% range, uh, but you should typically expect to see something uh, with a decent location in the four or 5% range for, for flow measurement. For the for the measurement of level and velocity, it's actually better than that. But when you combine the two errors, it, it adds up a little bit. So we have here an example of, uh, and I'm not sure how good this video will show because on my computer it shows, this happens to be a FLODAR in an irrigation canal. Um, so this is about 20 feet wide. And um, we, after this video was taken, there was actually a gentleman uh, from the geological survey come by and do what's called a, um, a profile or a velocity uh, velocity depth profile of this channel and calculate flow. And we were within probably four or five percent uh, of the rating itself. Uh, so uh, this is an example of open channel in a large wide channel. Here's another example uh, for a billing meter. Uh, this is also a FLODAR um, with a panel on the side of the road. Um, so I jump into the manhole with my camera, and I apologize if it's a jittery video. 
Uh, but this shows a meter that's probably been in now for 15 years, uh, directly downstream of a pump station. And right now it's not pumping. So it comes in uh, in spurts of uh, probably every five or 10 minutes and takes a reading and records it. So this shows you that it's out of the water. And this sensor probably has never been maintained in 15 years, just sitting there. It's As you can see, it's uh, it's pretty gross. So here's an example of a billing meter uh, in the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, this one happens to be solar powered. And um, so you see on the image on the left, uh, it has a pole with a solar panel on top, a panel holding what you see on the photo on the right, which is essentially the uh, the sensor controller and telemetry unit. And then in the back on the back panel is a solar charger. Um, very simple, very easy, very low maintenance because it's out of the water, it's out of the manhole, um, and it's measuring open channel flow. And I don't think I have an image of what's in the manhole, um, but it's an ABS manhole, so it's, it's actually very clean, very nice. Here's an industrial application. This is a semiconductor uh, fabrication facility. And so industrial waste, uh, they're being required by their city to measure uh, the flow that they're pouring to the city. And this is a great photo because it shows you the pipe right here. It loops around and comes in to the flume. And it comes in very slowly. Um, and it's a four inch pipe, but this is a one inch flume. So even though you have a four inch pipe, using a partial flume could cause problems in sanitary applications because a four inch pipe might be good for sewage, but a one inch restriction is not good. So this would cause problems. Um, and especially at this slow flow, you would have debris building up here. So the flow is coming down across through the flume and out to the sewage system. And this particular one is a Siemens, uh, actually it's a Siemens LUT uh, 400 for measuring open channel flow. Uh, and then this is an example of a wetted probe. Um, this is the uh, the Hawk uh, Doppler area velocity probe where the water is riding over the sensor itself um, and is measuring the speed and the depth of the water also. And this is in a sanitary application. And that's it. Um, I don't have any more questions on the screen, but I will be around. And I want to thank everyone for attending. Um, it's, uh, it's a pleasure. Uh, I, I've given a similar presentation to uh, uh, other organizations, California Water Environment Association, uh, and I've since updated this screen for today. Um, so if you have any additional questions, uh, you see my email uh, on the screen, um, the website for our company as well. That's the main office number. Uh, feel free to give us a call if you have any questions. Um, I put the main number up instead of mine because I realized people are going to be from all over California, Nevada, and even Hawaii. Uh, so um, let's see here. Uh, outstanding. Aloha. Well, mahalo to you for coming. Thank you. Um, yeah. So I'll, I'll be more than happy to sit tight here for uh, five more minutes if anyone... Uh, is brainstorming and, and thinking of any other questions, but um, and I can go back to any slides if they have any questions. Um, but uh, again, thank you very much. Thank my dog for not barking also. Ah, here's a question. Um, do we carry mag meters for flow? Yes, we do. So a mag meter, uh, we do carry those. Um, anything from, uh, I think, 16th of an inch all the way to 78 inches. Um, mag meters uh, are not for open channel flow. Uh, they're definitely for closed pipe flow. Um, but we, we have those as well, both uh, AC powered and battery powered. Uh, and then we have them with, telemetry and without telemetry. So a telemetry could be a, um, a mag meter for a remote location where we would connect up a, um, 
uh, a telemetry device and it would call and post its data on the cloud and it could even send you reports and you can look at trends and history and this is all battery powered or the traditional ac powered mag meter uh, for use in a, in a factory industrial or treatment plant water wastewater whatever so um so in answer to your question uh absolutely we can carry those is it necessary to calculate for losses due to evaporation through the sides and bottom of earthen channels? Um, I think some assumptions can be made. Um, what that um, that loss is, uh, evaporation um, is going to be a function of, uh, you know, of course, temperature and humidity. And uh, I, I don't, I, that's up to you if you want to try to calculate what that loss is. Um, but the measurement, whatever a measurement is made, it's at that window, at that point in location and point in time. Um, you you can calculate losses if you're looking at a straight channel, and by the time it gets to the other end of the channel, those two flow readings should be the same. Um, and if they're not, you have losses somewhere, whether it's seepage uh, through an earthen channel or uh, or evaporate evaporation. Um, in most irrigation applications. The desired accuracy isn't in the low single digits. Uh, some of the regulations out there call for 10% accuracy and even 20% accuracy. So they didn't want to put a burden on many of the farmers or agricultural applications to put in higher accuracy instruments. Um, so they, they loosened up that spec, if you will. How much error do we have on open channels and a weir? Um, uh, let's just say a weir. Um, a, a weir is non-linear. So if you look at the accuracy at the low end, it's quite poor, actually. So I would not use a weir that's maybe sized for a thousand gallons per minute when you only expect flow in the low hundred, you know, one hundred gallons per minute. Um, you've oversized it. Uh, so a narrower weir has a better uh, what's called a head to flow relationship so a a reaction to flow is going to be greater uh, with a narrower weir but a narrow weir also doesn't have a high top end so you might not be able to flow a thousand gallons per minute um, so the error you have to look at the graph and determine for that particular size weir uh, what uh, the uh, the air is going to be at a known height or depth if it's an area of velocity flow measurement same thing. You need to be aware of what the limitations of the instrument are and then determine what the accuracy is going to be. Um, every instrument is going to tell you, if it's level only, for example, uh, that it's measuring a distance plus or minus, you know, X inches or X uh, millimeters. You then have to look at the chart for that uh, flume or weir or primary device and determine if I'm off by half an inch, what is that reading going to change? <clears throat> Excuse me. So um, it looks very poor at the low end. In other words, it can't resolve oftentimes with bigger weirs. It can't tell you the difference between 100 and 200 gallons per minute uh, because that could be a millimeter right there in measurement. And if you're plus or minus a millimeter, you're going to be plus or minus 100 gallons. So you need to look at those two things, the chart for the primary device, and then the accuracy on that type of instrument that you have. Uh, can you also send a copy of this presentation in slides? Absolutely. So the uh, uh, plan is that tomorrow we will be sending everyone a link um, for this presentation. Uh, the LUT 400 accept pressure transducers and convert to flow. The LUT 400, uh, let me look that up right now. Um, the Hydro Ranger could definitely take a, um, definitely take an analog input of any type, whether it's a pressure transmitter. Um, let's test my search skills here real quick. Oh, of course not. Poor is my search skills. Uh, analog input. Can I take an analog input? Mm -mm 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 -mm. 
I had another Hydro Ranger question is can the output be dampened? All right, let's see here. Uh, 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 uh. Terminal blocks, uh, shield white. I do not think the, yeah, I don't think the LUT400 can take an analog input. Uh, it could only take the, um, the, uh, the ultrasonic. So I have your name here who's asking these questions. I will find out for sure if there's a problem. Um, and I'll also have to look up the Hydro Ranger question with respect to the, um, uh, the analog output and dampening. Um, transmitters have the ability to enter partial flume type as its dimension and formulas are saved in the transmitter. Yes. Is this irrespective of the primary measurement device? Uh, so depending on the manufacturer, um, some have better tables or built-in formulas than others. Um, so they all, however, have the ability to ask um, for a mathematical representation of that uh, primary device. So partial flume is a very common device. Um, in Siemens uh, firmware, you choose um, the, the type of primary device it is and the formula that it's used. Um, and then uh, you have to enter in your uh, 4 to 20 milliamp minimum range and your maximum range. Uh, so a partial flume, uh, as far as dimensions, there is a set formula for that. Uh, and that is built into the transmitter. Uh, or it could be a weir or it could be a Palmer bolus flume. So we will ask uh, that type of uh, question. And I'm going to look up the Hydro Ranger question now. If I spell it right. Okay, yeah, so the answer to the question for does the Hydro Ranger, let's see here, a milliamp, well, that's milliamp input, response rate, rate filter, alters. Of course, there's 71 instances of the word filter. You know, I want to say as far as the answer for the milliamp output filter on the Hydro Ranger, the answer would be no. You can filter out the uh, the input value, but I'm going to get confirmation of that uh, and let you know via email or some other method. Any other questions? <laughs> no, that's it. Well, if you're still on. Uh, Thank you very much. Um, 
feel free to give us a call or send me an email if you have any uh, lingering questions after this. Um, I hope everyone has a, uh, a great holiday season. And um, um, yeah, stay at home, unfortunately. So uh, in my particular case, uh, my wife's grandparents are in their 80s. And so I think uh, we're at that point where we're going to say happy Thanksgiving from a phone call. So um, I hope everyone is healthy and everyone's family is healthy. And um, uh, we will see you again physically one of these days. All right. Um, have a great, have a great day. Thank you.